what time will it take to medal in the 400? In the women's 400, I think oh. it'll be 401 or faster. 401 or faster. Okay. Uh, and to win the race, Titmus, Ledecky, or the field? Oh, I have to back Titmus always. You're not going to take the field in yourself. Oh, like I, I just, I know, I know, Arnie. I'm, I'm, I'm a confident swimmer, but I'm backing Arnie all the way. Yeah. Welcome back to the Social Kick Podcast. I'm Brian Lundquist. We got a full crew tonight: Dr. John Mullen, Luke Paddington, and joining us on her morning, she's in the future, Tamsin Cook. Hey, Tamsin, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you guys? Yeah, pretty good. What's the future like, anyway? Tell us. Yeah, um, very different. I mean, 12 hours from now, you guys are going to be living in a completely different world. So watch out. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It's nice mid midday here in um, in Cairns in North Queensland. So um, it's pretty good. We've got some good weather as well up here. So usually Australian winter isn't great, but it doesn't really get to Cairns. So it's nice and warm for us, which is good. Yeah, that is good. Well, uh, you're preparing because it's going to be even hotter when you get to Tokyo. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've heard it's pretty warm over there. So um, the whole staging thing, I guess, is getting uh, like acclimatizing to all that. Um, so we're trying to do our best I can, best we can over here. Well, actually, I think you're probably better off acclimatizing in the hotel room because once you get to Tokyo, you're just going to be inside in the AC for forever, <laughs> I think. Yeah, yeah, no, we've heard it's kind of a like in your room, maybe to the dining hall situation and the pool, and that's going to be it. Wow. So. That's what we'll be doing, I think. But um, we've got to stay safe as safe as we can. So, yeah. Hey, you got a big advantage, though, on the U.S. team. They still have to travel like eight hours from uh, from Hawaii, and the time change is pretty significant. So I think even though, you know, like a lot of national teams aren't going a little bit closer to the host country like they ordinarily would, um, at least you guys are it, you're in the same time zone as Tokyo for camp right now, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure we are. Like, I think – we actually have been really lucky with the way that it's worked out for us. I think we're in the same time zone, like not a super long flight. So all of those little extra things, you know, can add up a little bit when it comes to performance and managing like the plane and like your body through that period as well. So it's, yeah, I think we're actually like with the place they've chosen for us for staging is great. And, um, I don't know, like, I think with Australia, like, everyone just gets behind sports so much. So the setup we have at the pool here, like, we've got the whole pool to train in and um, it's just really nice. Like, we're in a bubble, but it's, like, the whole team is together. So, you know, you kind of still have people to interact with and you can go outside and, like, you know, get a coffee if you want to and everything. Um, but from apart from that, we're kind of in the hotel. But we get put up in such nice places and, like, really get taken care of. So, um, it's a pretty good way to, to live for the last few weeks. And you kind of need like this space to just focus anyway. So limit the distractions and everything. But didn't Dick Pound and IOC members say, you know, prelims for finals and time zones don't matter at all. It doesn't matter at all. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. I guess like we, we had a few meets where we did the, like the, nighttime heats and the morning finals like leading in so we had nationals sorry, heats. heats my bad yeah 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 nighttime heats yeah and sorry <laughs> not heats prelims um <laughs> we'll have a few of those during this hour i think um yeah no we, we we had a few like practice sessions of that and then for our olympic trials we went back to the the normal way for i suppose the more commercial side of swimming to get people to tune in and everything like that um so that was an interesting experience especially for me because i think a few of the guys had done it before the previous year but um i didn't so yeah it was it was weird doing the nighttime heats and it just meant that it was like super fast even for us like all of our, like, I feel like a lot of our events, especially like the events I do, Turner and Fauna Free, have gotten a bit faster in terms of Australian standards. But like in particular, swimming the nighttime heats, it was just, yeah, super quick to make it through to the finals. And then really interesting to see how everyone reacted with having to come in in the morning and trying to swim fast in the morning after that. Um, I found it quite difficult. But like, I think it was good to get those two meets in for a bit of practice, definitely before Tokyo. Um, and, you know, like I think with the Olympics, like it's a whole nother story, like so much more adrenaline, very different to just doing like a state level meet. And um, yeah, so I think we'll be, I think we'll be good. We've got, we've had a few practice sessions. So, yeah. 
Australian freestyle is so fast. What's going it's on? It's very fast. Honestly, like, it's crazy for me to look back to five years ago and think about, like, when I – like w- when I qualified for Rio um, five years ago, I swam a 406 to grab the second spot. And there was no one really like within a second, I think, or even two seconds of that. Um, and I was just under the our Australian standard qual time. And then this time, you know, I like I swam faster than I did in Rio, um, did a personal best to grab the second spot. And there was, you know, another girl just point six behind me. And then, you know, even more swimming like 406s, 407s. I think we had nearly the whole field under the Australian standard. And that's not even accounting for like the women's 200 freestyle, women's 100 freestyle, which also have like just made such a huge jump. Um, I think, yeah, I think a part of it is definitely Ariane, like leading the charge and kind of put like even though she's so far in front of us i do think it like just helps everyone you know she's making these like massive leaps forward um and for me at least i'm going well like we want to like keep that up and keep you know driving the upward pressure um and i think it makes a huge difference with like her swimming so fast to like, add depth to the sport and like depth to like everyone just knows that you now if you want to be in one of those freestyle events especially if you want to get a an individual spot you just have to be swimming like really really fast like world-class times which is hard but it's really good for australia i want want to continue that conversation but just for the listeners to know you anchored your olympic silver medal in a 156.4 i want to say um Mm -hmm. five years ago you went a 156.9 at trial you came ninth you didn't yeah. make the finals. If you had some in the no. US, you would have come fourth with that time. Yeah. You would have no problem. And 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 the US are the ones who won the gold medal who beat you in Rio. You would have come fourth. So this is this is knowing that the progression is insane for, for your time, your four four is faster you did it Rio. It's the fifth fastest time in the world now, I think, or something like that. It's incredible. So yeah, let's dive into that, guys. Let's dive into to, into that progression, the drop when I mean, Evans had that world record, Brian, you're saying, at 4.3. In 1988, she went 4.3. And it dipped under four minutes in 09, and it's just been dipping. What's going on? Why is the 400 free, 200 free in the world and in Australia dropping in? I mean, I think you guys need to, like, maybe tell me, because I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's your fault. You're making 4.4 look easy. <laughs> well, so we, before we started, we were, we were talking about um, the potential for, like, had maybe 20 years ago is when we saw the those those influential swimmers yeah you know that you said you're seeing on the women's side with um with Ariane and um and Ledecky but like we saw that with Thorpe and Hackett you know 20 years ago so uh, you know I don't know though is uh, it did, like is that true or um is there something that they've figured out for how to swim uh, the 400 free that is then influencing the rest of the women's field? And, you know, it's, it's changing the way that you all think about attacking the race. I don't know. Yeah, I think it does make a difference. Definitely. And, you know, I think it's it like, for me, I kind of go, well, now we've got, before it was just like Ledecky, obviously who was out, out there and like doing it and going so well. And now that Ariane is out there too, it, I think it kind of, um, it's still incredible to watch and still, you know, so far ahead of what I'm personally doing. But to have two women doing it, it almost kind of like, I think we can all sit around and go like, okay, well, now there's two of them. Can we get a third? Can we get a fourth? Can we get another, like, you know, will it be someone again under four minutes to now win the bronze medal if we have those two out there at the front in the Olympics? So, um, yeah, I think it, for me, it would probably mostly just be a confidence thing mm-hmm. that it's impacting um and i can look to them and even though it's they're so far ahead it's still like driving my confidence forward because um like we're all training really hard obviously and like ariane obviously trains amazingly well but i can like look to her and go like how close can i get um for for my races and i don't know whether that'll be this year or like later on but i think like we'll see some more girls come through and dip under that four minutes. Definitely. I think the race strategy has definitely changed. I mean, God, you look at Ledecky and Ariane, I mean, and, and yourself, you're, you're going out fast. Um, I, I yeah. think that's something that has 
changed over time in the women's 400 free where you guys are just tacking that race even more and, and holding on strong. So I think you get a few through the floodgates, like like uh, you're saying, and then it's like, okay, I can do this. Or yeah, at training camp, I'm right up there with her. I should be able to be up with her in the race. So I think the floodgates are starting to open up more and more in these races for the women. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. And, you know, it might not be me, it might be someone else, like, but I think it'll happen, definitely. And like you said, you're right, a lot of the girls are taking it out a lot harder. And that was part of my race strategy at trials was to be out fast, but just be out fast as relaxed as possible. Um, and then have like the confidence to back myself that, you know, I'd done enough work in like for that back 200 that I still knew that even though I was out in two minutes, um, I can still produce like a really good back 200 and not fade in the last, in the last like 50 or whatever. So um, yeah, I think race strategy definitely has changed. Um, and for me personally, it's just been like a really big, like learning process, like leading into Rio, going from trials, 2016 trials to Rio. And then now again as well, like I still feel like I'm constantly learning how to swim the 400 better and better. Um, and yeah, it's it's nice to kind of sit back and be like, I have been in the sport for a while, but we're still finding things to improve on every single time I swim a 400. Like, what can we do with turns? What can we do with breathing patterns? All that kind of stuff. Like, it all adds up and hopefully will produce like a technically better race. Whereas when I was younger, I kind of felt sometimes like I was just going as hard as I could. And that was it. <laughs> there wasn't that much thought going into it before. Is it just me or does it seem like a lot of the top men right now are trying to even split it or pretty close, whereas the women are taking a different strategy? Yeah, potentially. And I what, think like, you're right, the women are yeah. going out really fast. Yeah, because I thought um, I thought Elijah was, was back really quick um, in that whole men's field that was super tight. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Raspis, I mean, Raspis closes fast. I mean – um perhaps yeah yeah so i think you're right on on some of those but i mean then you have people like townley haas who would go crazy fast and then and then eat it a little bit so mm -hmm. uh, I, I have to look at the trends a little more but yeah i think the men's are certainly having a tough time finding finding the groove yeah americans are gonna have to do a lot to compete go ahead Luke. i was gonna say when we spoke to Zach and Sarita, he was saying that that 200 free final was just like the Kyle race where they all tried to react to Kyle and just do whatever Kyle does, they react to him and race him. But I get the sense it's not the Ariane race with you. I believe, I think it's your race with you. When you dive in, you don't react so much to her, you just react to how you are and what you are planning and what you're doing. Talk about how you get into your races now as opposed to maybe five years ago. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're you're right on with that. I think for me, if I was like thinking too much about what Ariane do, I'd just burn up completely. And um, I have always tried to be that kind of swimmer. Like I kind of put the blinkers on. Um, I do get a little bit like nervous. So I'm very process orientated. Like I'm constantly thinking of like what my cue words are for each hundred. And mm. um, like I have quite a like routine race plan and like, yeah, it gets adjusted, you know, every season with new things added in and something maybe changed a little bit, but um, it's absolutely like trying to swim my own race uh, because I know for me, I'm the kind of swimmer, whereas like until we get to the last hundred when then for sure, like it's a race, like, you know, just you're yeah. trying to beat the person who's next to you. But up until that point, a lot of it needs to be about like conserving energy at this point or like, you know, focusing on a stroke in this point. And so if I'm constantly thinking about what the people around me are doing, not thinking about my own, like my own race plan, my own technical skills that I need to be executing. So it's, yeah, very much put the head down and then last hundred is when I kind of let myself like have a bit more awareness because it's just a fight to the wall. And all of us knew that, like so many people said to me before uh, trials that it was going to be a fight for that second place. Mm -hmm. um, not so much, obviously the first with Ariane at the front and like, that's what it was. It was yeah. really yeah. like the, 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 the race was in the, in for the second place for us. So, yeah. But how did you enter with so much confidence having, taking two years of swimming off, I heard. That, that's, yeah. that's a chunk. I mean, two years of swimming for a sprinter is one thing, but what you do. Talk about that whole history. So you did Rio, you got your medal, you, know, you saw your lights out. A year later, 
what happened and then you know the time off yeah it's a bit of a long-winded story so if I ramble a bit just pull me up but um <laughs> yeah I guess like after Rio I kind of probably exceeded my expectations a little bit going in I wanted to swim fast and like my goal was to make the individual final for the 400 free I snuck in um I managed to do a personal best, which was great. And then I thought I'd potentially get a heat swim in the four by two, but I wasn't really that confident that they'd give me a final swim just based on like experience and all of those things. So then to get a final swim and to get the anchor spot was huge for me. Um, and to then for us to come away with a medal, like, you know, looking back now and knowing Australia's history with relays, it almost seems like it was expected, but at the time it's never a guarantee. So um, I didn't I didn't expect it and then to be able to like come away with a, an Olympic medal when I never ever thought that would be the case was huge um, and after Rio I got back and I think like I just I just really struggled like after the Olympics and I think a lot of a lot of people who go to the Olympics have that like post Olympic slump um, but for me I think it'd been such a period of high intensity leading into Rio like the I moved to my coach who took me to Rio in like early 2014. So I was essentially with him for like just two years. And that period was just such high intensity with training. And I was still trying to finish school. I was still in high school. Um, and then I like, you know, needed to kind of adjust my school. So I took an extra year to finish high school and did all these things to kind of like sacrifice other parts of my life to be able to swim fast at the Olympics, which I, I did. And when I got back, I think the gravity of my choices became really real. And I was like, oh, now I've done the Olympics. I didn't really have any goals post-Olympics. Like I, I, I honestly did not think past that point. It was like Olympics and then like what happens next? Who knows? I don't know. So I came back and I just like I had to do my extra year of school with none of my friends. And that was just really hard. So I like just emotionally was just completely up and down for ages after Rio. Um, and then I had a car accident uh, in the end of 2017. Um, so kind of leading into preparation for Commonwealth Games. And it wasn't really that bad, but um, it was, yeah, it was enough that I had to like, um, I, sorry, someone's just knocking at the hotel door. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Let them in. Let's see who our special guest is. We have plenty of towels. Thanks. <laughs> sorry <laughs> i put a do not disturb sign on but they must have ignored it okay i think we're all good um yeah so i'll just pick up i had a car accident at the end of 2017 so that like really impacted my preparation for commonwealth games but it was kind of more than that you know i kind of realized like I'd always been someone like a lot of swimmers who, you know, when you get an injury or just super frustrated, all you want to do is train. Like you just want to get back in the water as quickly as possible. And I kind of realized I was like, Oh, I'm not that keen to be training right now, which was like a really big thing for me because I'm an athlete who just always prides myself on working hard. And I was like, I don't want to work hard right now. And that was a huge identity crisis because that was like entirely what my career was based on. It was just trying to be a, the hardest worker I could. Yeah. Um, and so I still swam at Com Games Trials, but swam terribly. And then after that, I decided I was like, decided I was done. I was just really not in a good place mentally with my swimming. I really wasn't enjoying it. And I thought I might as well pull the pin now before I like really hate it and end up like getting to a place where I like, you know, have a, like a lot of resentment for the sport because I've always loved the sport before that. And I didn't want to hate swimming, uh, but I still didn't obviously finish on the note that I wanted to. So, yeah, like it was early 2018. I retired and I was fully done. I threw away all my gear. I gave all my suits away. I was completely convinced that I was done. Um, wow. And then I went off and lived a normal life for two years, which was great. <laughs> I love that. So, yeah, Where that was you... the period up until then. Where do you think that um, the the self awareness to um, prevent yourself from hitting you know rock bottom in terms of you know your appreciation for the sport? Where do you think that comes from? Because I don't think that I've ever met somebody who was aware enough to say, ah, "I'm going to step back." Oh, I've just watched the spiral, and then people mm -hmm. fall out of love with the sport, and then I see them ten years later, 
and they haven't touched a pool since because they got to the point that yeah. they it so much. Yeah, I think I don't I don't really know. Hey, it's quite hard to pick. Like, um, I'm just I think I'm a very like all or nothing person. And especially when it comes to swimming, I'm a very all or nothing person. And I just knew that like those two years after Rio, I wasn't putting in a hundred percent into my training. I like, I was like, I was still trying hard, but I wasn't at a hundred percent. And that was just so hard for me to reconcile because I know intrinsically that the athlete I am is to give a hundred percent. And I think it had, it had taken me two years to get to that point. Like it wasn't a, like, oh, after Com Game Charles, I didn't achieve what I wanted to. So now I'm going to retire. It was like two years of like push and pull and fighting with myself and my coach and just going back and forth and trying to get my head right constantly and constantly and constantly, like working with sports psychs, doing all the right things. And it just wasn't happening. Um, and so then the only solution I looked to was like, I need, I just need to step away. Like, and I obviously was convinced that I was done. Now I know that I wasn't, but yeah at the time I knew that I needed to step away and I needed to step away with no expectation to come back because if I was ever going to come back and I know that now it was going to have to be like something really like a really basic drive of love for the sport that brought me back not wanting to achieve anything not wanting to win medals or make teams or any of that it was going to have to be like I just want to get in a pool and swim and have fun with my friends like you do when you're 10 years old um so it was like I think that self-awareness just came from the fact that I just I don't know like I'd done everything I possibly could like I'd done everything I possibly could to try get my headspace where it needed to be and it wasn't there and I was like this is the only solution I can see right now and um I, I like I kind of had I did almost make peace with it you know I'd like achieved a lot more than what I ever thought I would get out of the sport I never was someone when I was like 10 years old going I like I always just wanted to make a team. That was all I wanted to do was make a team. So for me to like win a medal and make an Olympic team was like more than I thought I would, I would ever do. Um, so I kind of just, I'm, I it was like a, yeah, I guess it was just knowing that I, I didn't want to hate the sport. And I knew that if I kept going down that path, I'd end up in like a much darker place than I was already in. Um, and I had a really great family as well, I suppose, mm. who know me really well mm and who knew that I wasn't myself, I wasn't the athlete that I wanted to be. And it just happened, like the decision just had to be made. In my opinion, it was, it was almost like an injury, like, like I suppose, like mental health, you know, it kind of is like, I just had to step away. I didn't really have another option at that point. Yeah. I, I thank you for sharing this, the story with us, because as a physio or PT in the States, you know, I deal with tons of people that are injured or have injuries but then it, it just kind of unravels other layers kind of like yeah. you're alluding to. And it's one where a lot of athletes will identify with the, not just the performance, like at, at meets, like so many people think like, oh, well, they're, they're not going their top times. That's all it is. But it's not just that. It's, it's how you feel. It's the training. It's the, like you said, identifying with being yeah. the person that goes 110 yeah. percent. So. When you're sharing this, I think, like I said, it's important for everyone to listen to. And I'd love to hear more about when you realized it maybe wasn't all a physical injury and when it was maybe something bigger than that. Yeah, absolutely. I think now, like, you know, with hindsight, injuries are such a great indicator of where your mental headspace is at Mm -hmm. as an athlete. Because if you're, if you get injured and you're, you know, like you're doing all your rehab perfectly, you're super frustrated with the way that you're not training and all of that. It's like a great indicator of how much you like love the sport and you want to be in it and you have that drive. Um, But for me, it was kind of like I got injured and I was upset, but it was almost a relief. And I think that was a huge warning sign for me because it was like, oh, thank God. I don't have to put myself through this at training anymore for a little while, at least like I was kind of in and out of the water for six weeks initially after I first um, hurt my neck from the car accident. And it was like the biggest relief because I was struggling so much in the day to day at training just to get through sessions um, and to, to try and like desperately hit my targets. And I was getting so frustrated with missing them constantly um so having the break like the forced rest from injury and that being such a relief was just a huge indicator for me that like yeah maybe my head is not quite in the place where it needs to be 
I was going to ask you about the pressure you felt. You must have felt making that decision, surely. From the little things like, wait, you're not swimming anymore? Or come on, mm -hmm. you're so good, you got a silver. Or how are you going to go to uni? Or what are you going to do next then? Or how are you going to survive? Surely you got tons of these comments back then. Was that was there? But it was it your family support and your self confidence that got you through it. Talk about that process to, to go through. It. Yeah, yeah, it was really hard, and I, I totally understand where people are coming from. You know, you look at someone with like huge, like lots of talent, and yeah. also like for me, I was really young. I was only nineteen when I retired, um, and I had lots of people in the sport who maybe like didn't know me particularly well, but was still new swimming and new sport well, who just like could not wrap their head around it because from the outside, it's like, you've got it so good. You know, you're so young, just take a bit more time off or just do this or do this. And um, I was definitely questioned a lot for my decision. And I essentially wanted to just like slip into the background and disappear. Like I didn't, I didn't want to talk mm. to anyone about it at the time. Mm. Um, but there was like a little bit of media interest. So I kind of had to front up to the fact that I was retiring and I had to put it out there. Um, but I think what got me through was the fact that like my, my family has been great. They always have been. My, my parents have just said like, all we want you to do is enjoy what you're doing. Like as if you're loving the sport, keep swimming. If you're not, that's fine. Um, and as an athlete, I've worked really, really, really hard to have other aspects of my life always going while I'm swimming. So I never like have essentially I've never been a full-time athlete and I know that definitely works for some people like absolutely like some people can just be in it and you know not have uni on the side or work on the side and can do that but for me it doesn't really work that well I just get too much in into it and like end up like freaking out a little bit so I've always done uni I've always done school um, and I've always had a really solid group of friends outside of the water as well so I have great friends that I train with but I have school friends who you know knew me before I was good at swimming and like were with me through Rio and um welcomed me back with open arms when I could finally go and hang out with them <laughs> after I retired so that was huge for me and it was huge because like I like my kind of like lead into Rio was all through my high school years so I missed so much like normal teenage mm -hmm. stuff you know I didn't have like a, a prom um I didn't like go on any camps or anything like that um any school trips, nothing. And then I was online for my last two years as well. So I um, like missed a lot of that like social interaction that comes with being 15, 16, 17 years old. And I think I was really missing that. And so to have friends that just like welcomed me back with open arms and were like, yeah, okay, you're not swimming anymore, but you know, we go to the same uni. So we'll like do all these things together and we'll go on trips and we'll go on all these holidays that you like never got to do because you never could make it because you were swimming. It was like really just gave me the opportunity to appreciate life outside of the water, which in turn gives you the ability to appreciate life in the water as well. So um, yeah, that, that was like a huge thing for me. Just the people around you can make such a difference. Hey, so you're a two-time Olympian now. And with that comes a lot of experience. The Olympic teams always have a lot of newcomers, a lot of rookies. Um, you obviously have a ton of veterans on the team too, but coming with that perspective of, um, this being your second lap around the track and also, um, you know, having live a balanced life and not having all of your identity, uh, you know, rounded up in, it's obviously a prominent thing and a huge accomplishment that I'm sure you're quite proud of. And it's a big piece of who you are, um, or what you've accomplished, but it's not everything. And so, um, you know, do you feel like you're in a position now to, you know, put an arm around some of the rookies and share your experience with them and help them stay grounded. What's that, what's that position like this, this second go around for you? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm always like willing to or try my best to help out the rest of the team as much as I can. You know, if people need someone to chat to and they're like, need a bit of, I guess, I think it comes down to perspective um, because for me, essentially the worst thing happened. Like, I came back from Rio with the fear that I was going to be like a one hit wonder and I was going to like make that team and never make a team again. And then when I retired, I was like, oh, this is actually what's like, this is going to be the thing. I am wow. going to be a one hit wonder. I'm going to make one team and never be heard from again. <laughs> so I had to face that when I retired, like, and kind of like accept it. And I like, like I can't tell you enough how I really thought I was done like I I went traveling in 2019 I was not focusing on making Tokyo 2020 at all wow. um so I think for me it kind of is like 
you know what, like having the ability to say the worst thing might happen, like what you think is the worst thing might happen and the world's not going to end. Like your parents are still going to love you. Your friends are still going to be your friends. You're going to go home to your like same bedroom and everything's going to be the same. And like, yes, it will feel awful for a while, but then like you will recover. Like time heals everything. And that's what happened with me, I think, is like it just took a lot of time and probably a lot more time than I wanted and my coach wanted and everything for me to come to terms with like the start of my career. But um, yeah, I think as an older, like it's weird to think of myself as an older swimmer, but as an older swimmer on the team now, um, I, I hope I can offer that to the younger swimmers. But again, like I'm so impressed with our younger swimmers. Like they, they to me, they I look at myself and how I acted when I was 17 I, at Rio and I felt like I was so naive and I didn't know what was going on and I was so immature with like the way I raced and everything and the kids that we have on the team now who it's their first time I just look at them and I go you are so experienced and I think it's partly because they've come through programs maybe where they have those people to train with every day so you're like you know with Dean Boxer's group who coaches Ariane they have um one of the youngest girls I think on our Australian team she's 17 Molly and you know she has the ability to kind of train with people who are like world class and so experienced and I think that makes a huge difference like you're with them every single day and able to pick up on what they're doing every single day rather than just like like at different competitions looking to the older guys Luke is 22 an old swimmer I want to make a reference to a movie. I'm like, dang, I wonder if Tamsin knows this movie. <laughs> so hold on. So spoiler alert. 1960. You yeah. are, you're a contender for a medal at Tokyo. You have the four fastest time in the world this year going in. Um take us there. And I was and I imagine you being Rocky Balboa. Getting ready for Rocky Two, you're in in the back country fighting, and you know your son got kidnapped or something, and you make this comeback. Like, what do you do? You went to a shaman in Peru. Did you go to like? What do you do for those two years to get you ready? And when did this this this, this new the trip start of Mick? Mick, the same yeah. coach, same coach Rocky had. Same coach. <laughs> I don't know. Was it? I think his coach is Mick. Hey, wow, Mickey. That's, that's very amazing. He you would love that. Too. He loves he loves those movies so much. I'm gonna have to tell him that reference. What he'll, he'll did you run up. up at in Philadelphia? Did you have your yeah. in Come on, tell us what happened in those two years, and then you'll come back. I Me, mean, you're four yeah, so, one. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, well, essentially, like after I stopped, I didn't touch the water for a while, um, and I didn't really do that much exercise either. So I was just a usual 20, 21 year old living their life. Um, I was at uni full time. And then I actually went traveling in the back half of 2019. I worked at a summer camp in America. And then I went to Europe. So I did a whole like, you know, like, normal young person travel thing. Um, but then coming back to it was really interesting. So when when COVID kind of happened in Australia, we obviously locked down quite a lot and um, you were quite limited on, on what you could do yeah. um, in terms of your training. And so we were allowed like an hour outside for the first six weeks to go and like do our exercise. So like everyone was out walking at parks and everything. And so I would just go out like once a day with my mom and we'd go for a walk. And I ran into an old friend who I'd trained with um, when I was about 12 with a different coach. And he said like, I'm so sick of this. Do you want to go down to the beach and just swim and just, you know, like yeah. swim up and down the beach with beautiful coastline in Perth where I'm from. And I was kind of like, okay, like, yeah, sure. We can, mm -hmm. we can go down to the beach and swim. Like there was like no, nothing attached to it except for that. And so we started doing that. And then he said, how would you feel about doing the Rottnest Channel Swim, which is a 20K swim from um, Perth out to an island just off the coast? And he was like, well, we could do it as a duo. So we did 10Ks each and you swap and you like jump off the boat and you go back and forth. And I was like, yeah, like, you know, it'd be something, something to work towards. Sounds pretty fun. It's actually like a huge party when you get over to the island, like a super popular swim. So I was more like, this will be a cool experience. Anyway, but the same friend that I was training with, like he worked full time. So he was like only able to commit to like one or two swims a week. And then he was like always working. And I was like, oh, like this isn't too bad. Like I'm kind of think I want to swim a bit more, but I have no one to swim with. Like there was no, no one else really around. So 
I started going into the pool and I was actually, um, I had a part-time job at the time. I was working really close to the pool. So I'd just pop in and have a chat to Mick. And I was just kind of like, I guess, dipping my toe in, seeing how I was feeling, like reconnecting with Mick, with my old coach, like walking onto pool deck. Cause even that felt like a big deal at first. Like I hadn't been there at all. Like, and to, for me to like walk through the old building and see all the old staff who knew me, like it was really scary. So, um, I just started going and having a chat like, you know, once every two weeks or so. And then eventually I was like, I think I want to hop back in with the squad and just see how I go. Like no expectations. And initially what's funny is like, I thought potentially I would try and go over to the States and do college and do like a second degree or something because I just wanted to enjoy swimming. And I was like, well, if I can tee it up with university, then that would be amazing. Like how good, like I could go to a college and swim. And so that was like part of my reason for getting back in. Initially, I was like, that's what I'll do is I'll, I'll train. I'll try to get to like a two minute 200 free and like a 210 200 fly because I used to do 200 fly. And hopefully that'll make me attractive enough to try and get a scholarship somewhere. Huh. Um, so that was my reason behind starting to swim again. And that kind of carried me through until December of last year. Like I had no Olympic aspirations um, at that point. And then after doing more research, I realized that because I've like accepted sponsorship and like the uni just didn't quite add up, I probably wasn't going to be able to do the college thing. So once I put more time and effort into researching it, I kind of started getting knocked back and I was like, okay, (laughs) probably need to find a different goal then. Um, And it was around that time that Mick sat down with me and he kind of said like, you've come back really quickly so far. Like you're, you're for someone who's had like a bit of time off, you're actually swimming quite well do you want to just give this a go? Like, do you want to just see what we can do in 12 months of training? Like just see how fast you can swim in 12 months of training. And I love a challenge. And I was kind of like, yeah, why not? I suppose. Um, So that's when like the proper hard work started. And it was a bit of Rocky. It was a bit of Rocky action. Yeah. We, so me and Mick would do these, like I was swimming the same as everyone else. I started doing a bit extra for my distance training. And then on Saturday afternoons, we'd do these circuits. Ugh. And it was like the hardest training I've ever done in my life. We'd do these hour and a half, hour 20 long circuits. Like my average heart rate would be like 160 the whole time. And it was just about getting fit as fast as possible. And they're like very unsustainable. I reckon I can only do them for about 10 weeks and then I'm done because afterwards I couldn't do anything like pretty much with my weekend I was just wrecked like I'd be a mess on Sunday I bet like I could barely move and like I was just like we just put in for these circuits on Saturday afternoon after the training week but it was really good for like me for my confidence because I could sit there and be like all right this extra work has to make a difference somewhere along the line and like you asked me about confidence backing like you know, my 400 after only having trained for a short amount of time again. I think it's from that kind of work that like you're coming in, no one else is there. It was just me and my coach and just being like, all right, put my head down for an hour and a half, like work as hard as we possibly can for this. And um, like, I, I don't know, I enjoy doing that kind of stuff. Like it, it just like, the, it gives me that kind of extra, like, yeah, like from doing this, I know I can, like, I know I've prepped as best as I can. Like I know I've worked hard um so those were like the like the big Saturday afternoons they were crazy but um they made a difference and I got fit I think probably the fastest I ever have before <laughs> um so we yeah. gotta speak to Rowan Taylor and say listen Rocky <laughs> lost to Apollo Creed in the first movie but what happened in the second movie <laughs> we want Tan- Samson to anchor that relay get it in there oh, All yeah. right. enough Rocky talk what's um <laughs> So I'm just amazed at Saturday afternoons. Most swimmers, as soon as Saturday morning practice is done, it's like, I want my weekend. It's been a long yeah. week. Uh, on the very rare occasion, people like Phelps were here of training seven days a week. I'm sure there's yeah. other. Um, but man, that's what a, what a mature thing uh, to just, you know, commit to that. That's That's uncommon. Yeah. And like Mick gave me the choice, obviously. He kind of said like, look, I think you could do something extra if you wanted to. We used to do like Saturday circuits, like back in the day, pre-Rio days for a little while. Um, Not as hard as the ones that I did the last six months, but um, he kind of said, I think it'll help. Like I needed to drop some weight. I needed to get fit pretty fast. And he was like, if you're willing to do it, like the opportunity is there. 
And I, I don't know, I was just so excited about the sport again. I kind of was willing to do anything. Like I, I was just like, I was like a little kid. Like, I, I don't know, I would come into training and I would do a session and be kind of close to old times that I do. And it would just make me so excited. I was just yeah. like, oh my God, like I'm nearly swimming at 400 pace or what old 400 pace would be. And I kind of just wanted to take that momentum and run with it as much as I could because I was in the mindset of like, I don't know what this is going to lead to. I don't know what the, when this is going to end. Yeah. I might as well just go for it right now. Like I was very much living in the moment. And um, at the time I was like, yeah, why not? Saturday circuit, let's do it. Like let's do yeah. everything. Um, and yeah, it definitely, like it definitely does the job. Helps you get fit. So. <laughs> well, hey, yeah. so because, because you mentioned that like part of the impetus for doing that was to get fit and you said you needed to drop some weight. Um, a lot of times that can be a pretty touchy subject, uh, especially between, you know, athlete and coach. Um, was that, was that strange at all between you and your coach? Did you initiate it and, and, and call that, call that out? Or, I mean, it sounds like it was like a really healthy dialogue and process. Um, so I'm yeah. just curious, like how, how that went for, for you both navigating that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it is such a difficult thing in sport. You know, I think it's, it's so complicated because it's something that is, obviously like necessary to be an elite athlete is you know to be at your ideal weight and um, all of that and it's like it's connected to your performance for sure I think sometimes we put a lot more on it than is needed but it is a factor and like you can't escape that as much as we want to like we just can't um I've had my own like like kind of past struggles back and forth dealing with it and I think now it's just coming from from a different perspective like I know my body a lot better and this time around it was like about getting fit but I wasn't measuring like I wasn't weighing I was just going off how I felt um and it was a very trying to have a very like honest dialogue with my coach about it where I could express not only like what I wanted to achieve but also how I felt about it you know like I think he he understands a lot more and a lot better now like that it can be a difficult thing for, for athletes and to approach it with a bit of sensitivity can go a long way. Um, and so it wasn't the kind of dialogue where it was like, you need to be at this weight or you need to be doing this. You need to be eating this. It was very much like, how are you feeling at the moment? Like, do you like, do you feel like you need to drop a bit more? How, like, you know, we need to keep your strength up, but we like, it was, it was just very, like very honest um and I could kind of go to him like oh, I'm feeling quite anxious about all of this and he would go yep okay like let's talk through it and um I had a lot more support with that kind of thing this time around um and it was even though it was a factor in my performance I kind of decided that like if I'm swimming well and if I'm performing in the water then it is not something I need to be worrying about a huge amount you know, if I'm if I'm hitting my targets and I'm doing what I need to in training, in my swimming, in what like that's the most important thing, then I don't need to be thinking about weight all the time. Like I knew that it was a factor, especially in that first like three to six months. But like I try and make it as small as I possibly can because it can be like quite difficult sometimes. Mm. Could just be another stressful thing or something else to worry about, right? And that's what we're like what you suggested there, where it's yeah, weight plays a factor, but performance is performance. It's like weight room stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to increase how much you can lift, but not if you're not feeling well in the water with it, too. So it's yeah. one where it's like you said, it's a factor, but it's very much individual and in how it helps you move through the water. So, like you said, having that healthy dialogue is huge. And I'd love to hear more about, like you said, um, when you were turning to the pool, what were some things that you were working on towards getting back into shape? Was it just the focusing on the training or were there other factors that you're working on? Yeah, I think um, at first it was just like about getting in and getting through the sessions and getting through the work. Um, and we all also decided from the get go that I'd try and be a bit more strength orientated than I used to be. So, um, that kind of, kind of gave me a little bit more, yeah, pretty much like a bit more room to move. I actually got to like do proper chin ups in the gym and mm -hmm. try and lift heavy, which I, I haven't really been able to do in the past. Like for one, Whoa, you're I was a distance swimmer. Tired. 
No, no lifting heavy. You're a distance swimmer. <laughs> no, I know, right? Get on the I swim know. bench already. Get on the swim bench. Let's focus. <laughs> um, no, it was it was weird, and I think because at first, like. I didn't really have aspirations of swimming the 400. Like I was focusing on like just 200 and down. Like when I first got back in, in July last year, I was like, oh, I don't really want to swim the 400. Like it's a bit, it's, you know, it's quite long and like, ah, oh, like it'd be fun to be a sprinter for a while. So I just said to Mick, I was like, can I just do all the, like the 200 work, 200 and hundred work um, and try get a bit stronger in the gym at first. And I think because he was just like, yeah, why not? Cool. Let's do that. So that was the plan at first. I just like focused on like trying to be strong. Um, and then as we kind of like time went on and I realized I needed to do a bit more 400 work, um, all of those extra things faded a little bit more into the background and it became more about the work in the pool. And like I had ended up, you know, conceding and doing a bit, bit more extra K's here and there. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just like a fresh perspective, I suppose, that helped a lot um and just approaching my swimming from a different way like I've never really done that before I've always been the one who's like oh I need to do more k's I need to like do more work in the water I need to like it was just about how much I could do whereas like this time around I feel like it's been a bit more about like the quality of the work that I'm doing rather than just focusing on like the quantity of everything mm. I wanted to change tracks to to where we are now where we're going forward um so um I guess twofold. One, swimming Australia and sport in Australia are being led by two of the most famous swimmers of all time, Perkins and Bowman. And you got it. Your head, the head coach, Rowan Taylor, is so um, experienced and well known. Um, what's camp be like to get you guys to to ensure that you know the same mindset, the same positive, the same high standards that we saw at trials keep going on in Tokyo? What have they been doing that that was different from the real camp? Perhaps anything different? And what's camp like? What's your plans moving forward? yeah it is it definitely is different and I think like COVID is obviously a factor in that there's a lot more to account for with that um I think what helps for us as well is we have like so many athletes who not just our team leaders which we obviously do have but so many athletes that are just natural leaders in the mm. way that they conduct themselves every day like the level of professionalism within this team is just incredible to watch and like for me it's just something as simple as like pre-training routines mm -hmm. you know they are so everyone just knows exactly what they have to do and they just do it without fail without question um and it's just incredible like to be down on pool deck and like you know you don't have anyone sitting around like kind of like not knowing what they what they're doing before they hop in the water everyone knows exactly what they what they're meant to do and they just do it without fail and then also I'd say like it's just a very, very supportive team. And I think a part of that is everyone's been waiting like a bit less for me, but for a lot of people, like the, adding the extra year onto the prep is like everyone has been waiting so much for this moment. Like people just want to swim. They honestly, they just want to compete mm -hmm. and they just want to perform. Um, and like so many, of, so many of the guys have gone through the stress of like the Olympics getting pushed back. And um, I think it's forced us to all come together a lot closer and we all know that Tokyo is potentially going to be a bit more of a stressful environment too so everyone is just super super focused and really supportive of each other in trying to get the best performances out of themselves and I'd say that goes for athletes and coaching staff as well um, and being led as you said by very experienced people um, it's huge yeah I think it's it's a really great team and like like uh, uh, incredible team culture um, and very very welcoming and particularly for me you know I was I made one team and I've had five years away yeah. um and I just feel like welcomed back with open arms like absolutely straight away like you're back in great let's let's go let's swim fast it's just no questions asked which is really nice hey, do you feel like in an environment like this I mean I, I like my experience on national I was never on the Olympic team but I've been on some national teams traveling with the U.S. um and like you know it's a it's an interesting dynamic when you're you're you've got your home coach and then you're on this trip with you know a lot of other coaches some of them like coaching coaches of your rivals who are now your teammates yeah. and yeah. um you know that you have this opportunity to to learn from them uh but at the same time like stick to your plan and do what's right for for you and um and you know stay consistent so like do you feel like you are able to 
um, learn from, pick the brains of coaches, like, you know, kind of benefit from this, um, this chemistry that it seems like from the outside looking in that um, Australia does really well of like sharing ideas amongst all these coaches. Uh, do you feel like you're able to benefit from that in this environment? Yeah, I do think so. I think, you know, now because we're so close, it's a bit more closed in, like because we're so like mm. close to the game starting. I think it'd probably be a little bit more different if it was an event camp early in the year or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And for me in like my training, like I just want to stick to my own program right now. Mm. If it was three months ago, I'd definitely be like, yeah, like let me go do a session with this group or that group or whatever. Um, but I'm a very, again, like routine, like I like knowing what I like knowing what I do and doing the same thing. Um, but I do think it's it's just like the atmosphere of being on pool deck um, is really great. And I, I kind of find like um, for me it's about trying to be inspired by other people's performances in training. Um, and like I think what helps that and it's being inspired and not threatened, you know, which is always difficult because your competitors are training in the lanes next to you. Um and for me, what helps is just the the recognition, like this is a team environment and you're an individual as a swimmer, but like this is the team environment right now. And so if my competitor is swimming fast in the lane next to me, that's great because that means they're going to swim fast for Australia. Mm. Even if they swim faster than me, they're going to swim fast for Australia. And that's what's important. Like we all want to have our best individual performances, but um, I find it really like humbling and grounding to be like, no, we're a team now. And if people are swimming well, that's good for everyone. <laughs> like it helps us all, it benefits us all. Um, so obviously it can be quite hard, but like it's just really good to see people training well um, and like trying to be, letting letting myself be inspired by that rather than feeling like anxious about it. Is there a chance you get on the relay? The four by two. Oh. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it's one of those things that I think will be decided pretty close to the time. And like the coaches will obviously look at form, like leading in like the first few days of the meet. Um, I'd love to get a swim, whatever that may be. And like, I know that um, like the coaches know that I'd love to get a swim and that like, I hope that my, my track record with like last Olympics um, will be taken into account, of course, but I trust that they'll make the best decision for the team and whatever that may be like, I'll be fine with it. Like I will do everything I can to get a swim, but if that's not the case, like I will be the first one like cheering for the girls and making sure that um, they feel absolutely supported by everyone. Are you practicing relay changeovers? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> what, what's, uh, what, uh, tell, tell me about it. How, how are your relay takeoffs? They're not too bad. I mean, I don't have the greatest dive out there. Uh, that's for sure. Um, I definitely like can always do a bit more work on my skills, but um, it's been really fun getting back into the relay changeovers and we've got some really great like biomechs and stuff here. So we're getting some filming done um, and just doing like a little bit of work after every session on like various skills that so turns, dives, relay changes. Um, and I also have uh, Brianna Thrussell, who I train with as well, so who she might be considered for the four by two too. So um, we work together a lot on on practicing those little things just after every session. Five minutes go there, like makes a big difference. What's a good relay takeoff for the four by two? What are, what are the dolphins targeting? Well, I've been sitting at like point point three, and I have had no complaints Ooh, so far. Too slow. So, too slow. <laughs> Too slow. On, you're okay. a sprinter now. You are training for the 200. Yeah, yeah that's event. true. That's oh, true. you can eat a sandwich on the block at point three. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right. You got oh, shark and bake on the block. <laughs> oh. Yeah. If I see you out there, it better be in the point twos. Point twos. Okay. Great. Thompson, let's talk ISL. So you you put yourself up for the draft. You didn't get drafted. Yeah. What, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about what's happening afterwards? Talk about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with it. You know, I put my name in just like, I just thought, why not? You know, I just yeah. like at the moment, I'm kind of at the stage where like, I just want to compete and um, like have as many experiences as possible. Um, I wasn't really sure if I'd be drafted or not. To not get drafted, I was just like, I was kind of, I was pretty okay with it. Mm. I think for us as well, it's like, the group from Western Australia, we've been away since the start of April. 
So we haven't been home for a really long time now uh, because our borders are quite strict. So I essentially, yeah, I haven't been home for a few months and I won't be going home for like another six weeks or whatever at least. So uh, to not get drafted, it's okay. Like uh, there'll be, I'm hoping there'll just be other opportunities in the future. Um, and uh, I'm, I'll be pretty happy to, to go home for a bit as well um, and see my family. But I think ISL is a really cool competition and I'd love to be involved in the future. Um, mm. And I think it's 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 great that, like, it started when I was retired. So it, coming back in, it was really interesting to hear about everyone's experiences. Um, and I think that's what, like, I felt like I missed was that really team-focused, team-orientated racing um, that is just about mm swimming fast in difficult conditions, you know, like one hour, two hours to just get a couple of events in. I think it's a really great format and I really hope it continues. All right. What would your, what would your sales pitch be uh, as a free agent? If a team said, Hey, you can, uh, you can walk on, uh, but, but you got to sell what your value is to that team. What do you say about yourself? Oh, well, I feel point like three point three. <laughs> 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 point two hopefully um <laughs> oh, so i mean i think for this year i've kind of i've kind of said like it probably be a no like i don't i don't think i've got my heart in it for this year but for the future if i was to be considered for isl i think my my sales pitch would be like something along the lines of you know I've got a decent 400, a decent 200, and I'll even break out the butterfly if I have to. I did a, I was a 208 long course butterfly um, back in the day uh, when I was younger, and I'd be happy to get out the get out the butterfly and try to put together a good 200 fly. And short course might save me in that sense as well. So I try and diversify as much as possible. Plus on the relays, like any relay, I guarantee you I'm going to swim faster than my individual always. And how are you uh, stacking multiple races in a session? Yeah, good. That's what distance swimming is all about, I reckon. Yeah. Just treat it like a training session. We do multiple efforts. So, yeah, yeah got it. It's just, it is what it is, isn't it? I, I love it. It's fun. Like, and, you know, when everyone is in it and you're all kind of hurting together, it just makes it a really funny experience. So I love that kind of stuff. All right. right. If, you, if you could make the distance swimming in ISL more interesting, what would you do to it? Well, I've heard they're doing like a feet on the wall at the 200 kind of situation, get two extra points. So I think that is great. Um, what else can we do? I think maybe something to do with splitting. So like a fastest back end or like a like awards for like different kind of like ways people could race it could be really interesting. Like even split, like it'd be great to see like girls going like, I don't know, two minutes, two minutes and trying to swim four minutes for the 400 free short course. Like that would be insane. And like, it'd be really cool. Like it just makes it more interesting. I think in my lead in um, to, to Olympic trials now, I had a 200 um, at a, like a local meet where I was just not on. And so my coach said to me, just do your fastest back end you can. Like you can go out whatever you want and just back end it. And I still managed to swim a decent 200, but it was just like a completely different way of swimming it and made it super fun for me and meant that I didn't have like the expectation of just like trying to swim a fast 200. So stuff like that, I think could be really cool, really interesting. And potentially you'd have like someone out fast and then it would change at the 200 and someone coming home really quick. So um, make it pretty cool to watch, I reckon. I want to see them uh, make more of a team thing out of it. So if you've got two representatives from your team, um, like makes make some sort of format where you can draft off each other easier. Like maybe you swim in the same yeah. lane and do that some would be cool. tandem distance swimming. I don't know. Or you could or maybe having paces, like the boys could hop in and pace the girls or something like that. That would be interesting. Oh yeah. I like it. See, now we're talking. Okay. See, this, yeah. is, this is your sales pitch is you got to bring ideas about ways to grow the league and grow the audience and the fan base. Yeah. We've got people getting drafted not because of their swim times, but because they're great teammates and because True. they're like because they have a social media presence too. So I don't know. True. It's crazy. All right. We're gonna finish on the same theme with some uh, some quick rapid fire questions. Okay. All right. What's the hardest race in swimming? Um 1500 free. Olympic gold, world record, or ISL MVP? Ooh. Uh, Olympic gold. 
Do Australian kids play sharks and minnows? Yes. Passionately. What, what's the go-to game? A shark and surfer. Sharks and minnows. Well, the one the one I know is like, um, or what, what we do is like this like kind of version, I suppose it's like British Bulldogs or something, where like you have someone in the middle and then you're all trying to swim underneath and you like tackle each other uh-huh. and like getting people to the surface. That's pretty uh-huh. intense. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Uh, same, same for us. Okay. Yes. What's, what's something silly that the Aussie women's Olympic team does for team bonding? <laughs> Probably trying on all our uniform in various ways together. We get some <laughs> interesting gear. I got a hockey dress in Rio. So <laughs> I'm, I'm think, hoping I'm going to get another one and then I can double up with my Rio hockey dress and my Tokyo hockey dress. What are, what are you thinking so far of your uh, your Tokyo kimono uh, halves, halves jacket thing? Yeah, I love it. It's great. I think, I mean, I don't know how I'm going to really work it into my everyday wardrobe, but I'm sure it'll it'll come out every so often at like a dinner party or something. You know, wear green and gold every day? Yes, everything green and gold. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, annoying or not annoying when someone says they gave 110%? annoying <laughs> if australia had a, if australia had an isl team what would it be called oh well we were thinking about this the other day like um i don't know if you know uh with kyle he has like a he he like loves like lizards and like reptiles and stuff yeah. like that yeah like he's really into it so i think because of his like presence, we probably would end up being like the Australian anacondas or something like that. The anacondas. All right. Yeah. Because you already got the frog kings in the same time zone. So, <laughs> and, oh, true. Hey, the, the frog king uh, fan base is going to come out strong for the Olympics. So, yeah, definitely. From that team. Okay. Yeah. What, what time will it take to medal in the 400? In the women's 400, I think oh. it'll be 401 or faster. 401 or faster. Okay. Uh, and to win the race, Titmus, Ledecky, or the field? Oh, I have to back Titmus always. You're not going to take the field in yourself. Oh, like, I, I just, I know, I know Arnie. I'm, I'm, I'm a confident swimmer, but I'm backing Arnie all the way. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, we're excited to see that battle. Uh, a lot of intrigue with how fast Arnie swam and um, Ledecky not, you know, looking as sharp, at least, at the trials. So, uh, man, like the Aussie women, this team has been so impressive to watch. It is like one of the coolest things for me, for us as swim fans to see going into the Olympics is like, wow, look at that depth and, um, you know, wish wish you all the best. It, it'll be a fun camp and prep for the games. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it's um, – I'm kind of in the same boat. Like, it's been really cool to to be in it and to watch as well. Like, it's just crazy. So, um, yeah, let's just hope that we can keep at it and produce better performances in Tokyo. Oh, yeah. Go do it. All right. Well, thanks for hanging out, Taz- Tamsin. Um, this is uh, – this ep- that's it for this episode of the Social Kick Podcast, and um, we'll see you later. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it. And be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at The Social Kick Podcast. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick. And you can find all of our content on our website at thesocialkick.com.